If one kept a record of such things, February 8, 1938 should be remembered as one of the greatest entertainment days for Charleston, a sleepy little town in East Central Illinois. For on that Tuesday afternoon, the Will Rogers Theater celebrated its grand opening with great anticipation and fanfare. The 1100 seat, fully air conditioned auditorium, built in the Art Deco style, could boast. There is not anything equal to it within a radius of 150 miles of Charleston. The police blocked traffic on Monroe Street in front of the theater to allow the crowd easier access. Leland Hall was 18 years old at the time. I was one of the lucky ones that got through the doors. It was a real mob. I remember the crowds being lined up all the way to Benedict's and out into the street. The first time I went to this show was in 1938, when I think when they had the grand opening. When we came here for that opening, and we got we got in the front uh, front seats at the at the first step, whatever it was, and we could see everything. So I was real thrilled that we got to sit there because usually we had to go to the back. Distant visitors, including film executives from St. Louis, were in attendance. Paramount Films executives speaking to the audience said the new Will Rogers surpassed even their fondest dreams of what a modern theater could be. Several movie stars sent opening day congratulatory telegrams to the Will Rogers theater managers. The actors included Alan Jones, Joan Crawford, William Powell, Clark Gable, Myrna Loy, Robert Taylor, Fanny Bryce, Spencer Tracy, and Judy Garland. The telegrams were displayed in the theater lobby and printed in the Charleston Courier. The grand opening performances included the latest movie hit as well as live acts on its 20 by 40 foot stage. The nationally acclaimed Ina Rae Hutton and her Mellow Deers, an all-woman band, performed three acts on that Tuesday, starting at 2.30. Leland Hall said, Ina Rae Hutton and her Mellow Deers were a real swingin' show, not like so many of the big band sounds that were popular back then. The live act alternated with showings of the major preview movie, Everybody Sing starring Judy Garland, Alan Jones, and Fanny Bryce. Designated as a preview movie theater or pilot theater meant that film companies would test box office receipts to see how much money a movie could gross. They sometimes ran films a month or two ahead of Chicago, according to former projectionist John Kruger. The construction of the Will Rogers Theater was a part of Charleston's million dollar building program begun during the waning years of the Great Depression. The courthouse square was the center of both the social and commercial life in the first half of the 20th century. But with the addition of big box stores and fast food restaurants and other businesses along Lincoln Avenue during the 70s and 80s, the center of life gradually shifted away from the town square. In fact, there is not one business on Charleston Square today that was in business there in the 1930s. So when the Will Rogers Theater closed its doors on December 6, 2010, it may have signaled the end of its colorful 72-year history. Before we signal this as the final curtain to this story, we should first ask how this remarkable building came to be in the first place, and why in the small college town of Charleston, Illinois. Our story begins by tracing the lives of two Italian immigrants, Dominic Frazina and Antonio Bianchi, who met around 1920 as fellow coal miners in Kincaid, Illinois. My father came to this country as a young man took a lot of courage to come to come along, a 13-year-old child. He got started in Pawnee, Illinois, and uh, in fact, I think he was a coal miner at the time, and, and this coal miner uh, came in somehow, I think, into a restaurant where, where, where my mother was, was uh, a waitress, and uh, said that he, he uh, was going to buy a theater. My father 
father didn't even know how to operate or run it. In fact, he ran the first reel upside down because he didn't. nobody showed him how to thread the machine. The Taylorville Breeze Courier Centennial Edition reported that Frazina got the urge to enter the show business when a traveling movie picture outfit stopped in Pawnee. Dominic was so thrilled after seeing this first show that he scraped together $300 to buy the whole outfit. That depleted his finances so badly that he had to borrow money to pay the charges for the film he was to show on opening night. Frazina and Bianchi purchased the American Theater in Pawnee, Illinois in 1920. They worked in the mines by day and ran the theater at night. It's not clear how long they continued to work at the mine or how many theater ventures they purchased as partners, but Frazina went on to become a leading showman, owning over 100 movie theaters at the height of his career. My father uh, found partners to go in with him because they were Italian like he was. They were very family and closely knit friend oriented. Family and friend oriented. And so they, they try to bring those people in with them when they, they go into a in 1924, Frazina and Bianchi purchased four theaters in Mattoon, Illinois. Why they chose to purchase theaters in Mattoon was no coincidence. During the last half of the 19th century, Mattoon was probably the main theatrical center south of Chicago. Being at the intersection of major railroad lines, companies doing business between Chicago and St. Louis had to switch trains in Mattoon. With its reputation as a showtown that catered to overnight visitors, businessmen and families sought out Mattoon as a destination for musical comedies and later vaudeville and motion pictures. Although some lasted only one or two years, Mattoon had at least 12 venues between 1906 and 1947. Ed Clark was the third partner in the Mattoon Theater purchases. After business dealings took him to Taylorville, Pena, and Springfield, Clark settled down in Mattoon. Bianchi moved to Charleston, and Frazina settled in Taylorville. Frazina, Bianchi, and Clark built the Clark Theater at 1815 Broadway in 1936. By 1938, the partnership owned the three remaining theaters in town. The Mattoon partners showed first-run movies at the Mattoon and Time Theaters and relegated second-run features to the Clark Theater. The spring of 1947 marked the opening of the Skyway Drive-In Theater, located about one mile east of Mattoon on Route 16. The Bianchi and Frazina Amusement Company bought it in 1952. That was the year Ed Clark retired and sold his one-third interest to his partners. There were 100 theaters when they had the drive-ins in operation, but then the drive-in land became so valuable that we had to give it up and, and uh, uh, you know, concentrate on just the four-wall theaters. On March 1, 1957, Bianchi sold his interest in the theaters to Dominic Frazina. Antonio Bianchi and his son, Reno, continued to manage the theaters in Charleston, where they resided. The Frazina, Bianchi, and Clark partnership expanded into Charleston, where they purchased the Rex and Lincoln Theaters in 1927. The Rex was located on the west side of the square and the Lincoln on the north side. The Burner and Mitchell buildings in the center of Monroe Avenue were torn down to make room for the Lincoln Theater, which opened on February 4, 1921. With the Cecil B. DeMille's production, Something to Think About, starring Gloria Swanson. It's not clear when plans to build the new theater were formulated, but friendly competition with Mattoon may have been a factor. People used to run to, to Mattoon because it was theater, bigger town, and they seemed to get the movies quicker. Construction on the Will Rogers Theater began on August 1, 1937, on the northeast corner of the square. The local newspaper reported that the property was secured from William Kenny and Ms. Mary Cadle. Round the Square calls it the Pew House. After the Will Rogers Theater opened, they closed the Rex Theater, and the Lincoln Theater showed second-run movies. Both the supervising architect, Carl T. Meyer of Springfield, and the general contractor, Roy Kennedy of Taylorville, had already completed many other theater projects for Dominic Frazina. Although no known blueprints of the Will Rogers Theater have been uncovered, several other theater blueprints by Meyer have been found, including these from Olney, Springfield, and Washington Park. Meyer also designed the Hart Theater in Effingham. Like many other architects of the day, Meyer incorporated the Art Deco style into both the exterior and interior theater design. I remember visiting him at his office in uh in the Myers building, I believe it was the 10th floor. I was so happy to know that that's where he worked and where he went in the daytime, you know. And I remember uh, meeting his apprentice, 
Phil Trutter. I went over to his home um, maybe a year or two before he passed away, and he gave me a lot of information on the buildings and the homes that my dad did. This is Carl T. Meyer's original sketch of the exterior of the Will Rogers Theater. Another theater in Springfield designed by Meyer was originally called the Will Rogers Theater. The name was changed before it opened, perhaps because of the one built in Charleston. By the time he built the Will Rogers Theater in 1937 and 38, the general contractor, Roy Kennedy, had been building theaters for 20 years. Even so, Kennedy stated that he had never arranged one so beautiful as Charleston. One of the interesting things that one of my cousins said, if uh, Dominic Fresina had something going on, Roy Kennedy had his hands in it too. And if Roy <laughs> Kennedy had something going on, Dominic wasn't far behind on that one either. So I think they had a lot of projects that they had mutual interest in. Exactly. I know they're right at Roy's place though. They had the factory with the, um, the mirrors, windows, because everything was custom in all the movie theaters. Yeah. Every movie theater was designed for its space and uh, the number of seats. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, my dad, Pat Kennedy, who'd be Roy's grandson, he said that your dad loved um, up lighting, back lighting, um, the mirrors. mirrors. You love he loved the mirrors. Love mirrors. You don't know. And, and Roy Kennedy had, uh, in many places where he had done work, um, he would put people's initials like in the glass, you know, or little mm -hmm. specialty touches to make something Mm -hmm. you know, customized and, and different, yeah. and I'm sure that's from the influence of all the, all the movie theater work they've been doing, you know. <laughs> right, right. I have Roy Kennedy's desk at home, uh -huh. and I feel like I really have gotten to know him, and I've learned much more than I ever thought I would about all these movie theaters. Um, I, I didn't realize the extent of uh, Fresina Amusement Company, and I didn't realize the extent of uh, or the volume of uh, movie theaters that Roy Kennedy and his sons all worked on over the years. I had no idea. They usually yeah. worked on all of them. You know, yeah. my father used to always want to, you know, your family to uh, to make because he felt like you really put the quality in the materials uh, that we were, were going into making the theater, and that they would be quality and they would be lasting. The distinctive Art Deco facade is unique for commercial buildings in Charleston. It utilizes terracotta in geometric and floral low-relief ornamentation. The Art Deco design also included six retail spaces along the facade, one to the west and five to the east of the theater entrance, unifying the look of the whole block. Back years ago, they loved that de Deco design, and would Carl Myers kind of uh, um, put those details in, but then there's sometimes they go in and do a quick rehab, and you know, have the specialty glass and things make it look, um, you know, tie it into the building in keeping with its architectural design. Mm -hmm. and, and it always made it look more expansive and oh, bigger, yeah. you know, yeah. made, made you feel bigger. Yeah, you know, they're very elegant buildings and um, just real attention to detail, you know, I think the details made all the difference. This promotional film was shown at other theaters owned by Frazina, Bianchi, and Clark. The grand opening of the Will Rogers Theater on February 8, 1938, did not disappoint and immediately became a magnet for evening shows during the week and all day Saturdays and Sundays. John Kruger, who worked there from 1942 to 1974, said, Sundays were a big day at the Will when sometimes up to 3,000 people would attend movies shown from 1 to 9 p.m. They came from every place. Everybody went to the show. That was the only thing to do in those days. We went to the theater uh, every uh, Saturday and Sunday. Loved it. If, if we could save 10 cents, I'd be here every Saturday afternoon. I was seven years old when they opened this theater, and I think we came shortly after that. My dad uh, was a fan of Will Rogers, so he was anxious to come to the theater. We uh, spent a lot of time as a family, as, a, as, a, as neighborhood kids, as neighbor families uh, at the Will. And, and we never really called it its real name, or the full name anyway, it was the Will to us. And then right behind the ticket taker was this great picture of Will Rogers, right there, with lights shining up, shining down. <clears throat> it was 
for a young kid, it was almost, he was almost intimidating. What I remember most about this theater is the fact that when you walked in, I was always in awe every time I walked in this theater. And, and I'm not kidding you, I was. Uh, the, the beauty, the Will Rogers, the great big picture of him, the beautiful stairs, going up to the restrooms. Then you'd walk into the theater part. And I was, I'd, I'd always look up and look around at all the Art Deco every single time. I mean, you know, maybe I led a simple life, but, <laughs> but I loved it. The Will Rogers became sort of special to uh, uh, the uh, Roy Kennedy people because uh, they, they built so many others, and this one was built to memorialize a man, you know. And they thought that was unusual and, and different, which it was. It sure was, because I mean, most theaters would have had a name like Capitol and the Strand and the, you know, that kind of thing, the Roxy, you know, all that. And uh, this one had a man's name. We didn't have the big uh, uh, cineplex out in between uh, uh, Charleston and Mattoon that we have now, so it was the place to go. And uh, probably my favorite uh, memory of it is going to see Star Wars for the first time. I worked at the Will Rogers Theater in Charleston uh, from 1948 to 1951. Uh, we lived about three doors from Tony Bianchi, and uh, he was the owner and his son, Reno Bianchi, was the manager of the theater. Reno did not allow Cokes or soft drinks, and he didn't allow chewing gum to be sold. He had big boxes, and I think they were a nickel or a dime for a, you know, just, you know, a container that high of popcorn. When I think about the will, I think about, I think, I, I think my most vivid memories are Saturday matinees, because they were always double features, and, uh, you would pay your uh, 25 cents or 35 cents. When you walked in after you paid and opened the doors and walked into that lobby that uh, angled upward with the big geometric design on the floor, you had the movie posters on each side. So you kind of made your plans as you were walking up to see that movie. The ticket taker was dressed in a uniform at the time, um, kind of a maroonish uh, uh, jacket, brass buttons, uh, pretty formal. The staff at the Will Rogers Theater were very proud of being in the theater business, and yes, we, we asked, asked them if they'd like to wear uniforms, and they said yes, they would. So uh, uh, that's why we then had, you know, a cashier and, and uh, a doorman and uh, ushers and, and concessionaires. The ushers were there, and uh, you could tell them where you wanted to sit, and they'd walk you down to the aisle with their flashlights. The ushers themselves were your classmates. They were guys you might sit with in class on Monday. And uh, but they had a little bit of power and they knew it. And the first movie would end of the, of the double feature and then the lights would come back up. Then they'd have a Saturday afternoon drawing. And uh, the, some of the ushers and some of the management would get up here on this stage. And uh, they would always make the announcement as you were coming in on Saturday and, and gave your ticket initially to the ticket taker, save your ticket, save your ticket, you know, we're, we'll have a drawing in between movies. So they, they'd they have this big crank thing and then they'd reach in and pull a ticket out and who has number two, zero, three, four, somebody would jump up, it's me, and then they'd run up one of these side aisles and come up from either side and, uh, grab uh, and then would get their prize, whatever that would be, and it would be a you know, water pistol or a hula hoop or a whatever it might be. And probably, they did probably, uh, I don't know, eight or ten of those prizes, uh, you know, every Saturday, and then, they'd, and then they'd all clear off again. And then by that time, the projectionist had got the second uh, film ready to go up there, and the lights would come down again, and, and uh, you were all ready for the second feature. We used to have bank night, and, and you, if you came and bought a ticket, you didn't have to be present to win if your name was called, drawn out, you know, for the cash prize. That was sort of an inducement to, uh, to get you to come to the, the movie, and, and uh, even if you didn't, uh, all you had to do was keep your ticket stub to prove that you were at the movie. The Frozina chain of theaters was always running some kind of promotion. The reverse side of this ticket from the collection of the Coles County Historical Society reads, Admit One Child to the Big Free Wholesome Bread Show every Saturday morning at the Mattoon Theater. 
I would say by the time the second feature was over, it was probably close to 4.30, 4.45, something like that. You'd take your date to a uh, coffee shop or uh, just across the street here, just across Monroe, was Pizza Joe's. After the movie, we would either go to King's Bookstore, they had a fountain, or we went to Hill's Drug Store on the south side of the square. After the show, we'd go either get a Coke um, at one of the King's Brothers or Cobalt's or Al Drug Store and uh, go into a jewelry store. And then Miss Grant had a hat shop, so sometimes we'd go in there and see what she had. We lived in the country at that time, and we would go to town on Saturday night, and that was a, everybody did this. And you bought your groceries, and the men went to buy whatever they needed to buy and get a haircut. There were people who would go early and take their cars down and then walk later downtown. So they had the choice spots of uh, watching people, and that was what you did. You watched people. And we moved to town, and then you get your, girl, your girlfriends, and you spend lots of time, especially on Saturday afternoon, going in every shop, and then walking, walking, walking around the square. And uh, so it, it was, as a matter of fact, I met my husband as he was walking around the square. I have twin sisters and a little brother who uh, liked it because I was working there, and if I worked there, they got in free. The difference between the Lincoln Theater and the Will Rogers Theater, uh, the Lincoln Theater was smaller, and they had the B movies. They had uh, all the cowboy shows on Saturday afternoon, um, and they didn't have the big movies like they did in this theater. But um, it was still fun to go, you know. But usually I only went to that theater on Saturday afternoon. Uh, I, I didn't go on Sundays there. Uh, not when you could get the big shows here. In the <laughs> and then we'd, we'd watch sometimes in the dance shows and so forth. And then uh, we'd go home and make costumes and try to react the whole movie. And if it was a cowboy show, we'd go home and act like cowboys and Indians and so forth. I, there was a lot of kids in my neighborhood. And so I, I just have really wonderful memories. When we had big blockbuster uh, movies, and that could have been at either one, they would be lined up three and four deep around the, around the corner. Uh, my mother-in-law, uh, Norma Sunderman, who's now 91 years old and living in Champaign with us, uh, was a ticket taker here at uh, the Will Rogers. In fact, she started at fi age 15 at the Lincoln Theater, and then when the Will opened up in 1937, she moved over to the Will. Tony Bianchi asked her to come over and be one of his original ticket takers. Uh, she was Norma King at that time, and met Bill Sunderman, who was an usher here. And uh, they married in 1946, but they didn't know one another until they were ticket taker and usher here at the Will Rogers. In the war years, particularly, there were lines clear, you know, out down the sidewalk, uh, clear crossing the street, clear on the north side of uh, the square, waiting to get into the Will Rogers. You know, it was just, uh, you know, I mean, and, and that was night after night. Even though vaudeville was gone by the time the Will Rogers came along, Myers designed it with a large stage and an orchestra pit. Besides Ina Ray Hutton's live act on opening day, not many remember other live performances. There were dressing rooms downstairs here. And uh, uh, that's uh, folks like uh, Ina Mae Hutton and the Melodeers, they would come in and uh, they'd dress downstairs and come up here and uh, they would roll the screen up and then she would perform and uh, after they'd leave and then they'd put the screen back down and show the film. Elaine Uli participated in a beauty pageant a few years after the will opened. And they had all the Charleston girls, a lot of them was from the college and it was on the stage, and it was quite important because everybody, the, there were so many of us that we all had parents, the place was absolutely crammed. Jack Chaplin was here uh, to talk about the movie he had made, uh, and then they showed the movie, but that's the only thing I saw. There wasn't the suspended ceiling or anything. We had all of the nice uh, uh, tapestries and uh, all the Art Deco trim. Uh, Upstairs were the original washrooms. It, uh, the people that owned it took good care of it, but they didn't really keep up with any of the repairs. When something started to break, it was broken. 
but uh, uh, you didn't see any mold or peeling paint or anything in those days. It was, it was still pretty nice. The will has undergone many changes since it opened in 1938. The owners had to adapt to changes in the film industry. During a remodeling in the 1950s, the seating was reduced to 783. A wider screen was installed when CinemaScope was introduced. In 1979, it was added to the Coles County Register of Significant Places. He passed away in, when he was in, in the business. And so uh, we continued to operate it and, until uh, we sold into uh, George and Marge Carasotas. And, and I, I knew them personally and liked them. They were very nice people. The theater closed its doors in October 1982 during the showing of a film named Things Are Tough All Over. Carasotis Theaters purchased it in May 1983 and turned it into a two-screen theater, reducing the seating to 667. In 1984, it was added to the National Register of Historic Places. In May 2010, AMC bought out Carasotis Theaters. And on December 6, 2010, AMC closed the Will Rogers Theater. In April 2011, the Will Rogers Theater was added to the list of 10 most endangered structures in Illinois. In November 2011, Katie Tricoli purchased the Will Rogers Theater with the intention of restoring it to its original grandeur and offering a variety of film and live entertainment. It was a major hurdle just to come up with the down payment and to secure the building. Um, from that point, we've come in and we've taken out the nasty old carpeting, We've started to dismantle the things that, you know, they twinned the auditorium. There's a wall down the middle of the auditorium. They, they, they put projection screens on two sides. So those had to come out. That all is gone. Um, we found the beautiful, beautiful terrazzo floor underneath the lobby entry foyer. You know, it's amazing and it's all still there. So the bones are here. You know, we're in destruction phase, <laughs> um, but we also have a, an architect's plan. You know, we have a, a blueprint for where we're going. We, you know, when this building was built, it didn't have handicap accessible bathrooms. The bathrooms were on the second floor. It was a major hurdle to figure out a way to put handicap bathrooms on the main floor. The restoration of the will hit a major setback when First Farmers Bank served Katie and Jim Tricoli with foreclosure papers in fall of 2015. In the wake of this news, a group of interested local citizens formed the Will Rogers Theater Project. Set up as a nonprofit, its mission is to purchase, restore, and operate the historic Will Rogers Theater in Charleston, Illinois. across the country in large and small towns alike. Communities are repurposing their old movie theaters, bringing new life to downtown commercial districts, and creating lively cultural environments. Whoever the future owner of the theater ends up being, a lot of fundraising and hard work remains until the residents of Coles County can have another movie-going experience at the will.